Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Awake Nation News for Friday, December the 8th, 2023. I'm David Zublik. And I'm Penny L.A. Shepard for the Awake Nation News, and we've got the scoop. Also join us at the Awake Nation News on YouTube and hit that like button and subscribe. Here are our headlines for today. Mother and son who aided in theft of Pelosi's laptop on January 6th are sentenced. Online sedition hunters identified the mother-son duo after the FBI mistakenly raided the Alaska home of a woman it mistook for Marianne Mooney Rondon. And I know that individual. I tried to get her on our on our show, The Awake Nation, mm -hmm. um, but she actually had her the door of her uh her establishment broken down. I don't know if they ever paid for that. No Additionally, uh, the FBI took her life savings. Now she's fighting to help others get theirs back. Linda Martin was a safe deposit box holder in which they uh, acquired all these safety Doing deposits. Doing a lot of that lately. And a lot of these people haven't been charged with any crimes and they have to go through hell to get their property back. Nope. Because uh, they're, you know, it's like the banks. They're using your, your funding um, in the interim be, you know, for whatever their potential uh, reasons are. Kevin McCarthy to resign from Congress after being ousted as House Speaker. Rep. Kennedy, excuse me, Rep. Kevin McCarthy says he's stepping down, but will continue to recruit Republicans to run for office. So, you know, he finally got kind of dethroned. Convicted murder. These are other stories who became the White House nanny. And devastating loss, Hollywood figure killed inside home, LAPD says. We also have another section, David, which I started for entertainment. Um, so, uh, you know, entertainment news, because we do so much of that. So I put a, lot, a little picture in there for entertainment. David? All right. A mother and son who aided in the theft of former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's laptop whom online sleuths identified after the FBI mistakenly raided the home of another Donald Trump supporter in Alaska, were sentenced Wednesday. Marianne Mooney Rondon and her son Raphael Rondon were arrested in October of 2021 after they were identified by online sedition hunters who have aided in hundreds of cases against Capitol rioters. Uh, and there you can see a photograph there. Cobb said that it was a difficult case and that neither of the defendants were criminal masterminds. Certainly doesn't sound like it. I'm not suggesting that you two are stupid or idiots, he said, but she said they engaged in juvenile behavior. I think that they were acting very stupidly, Cobb said. No offense. She said she was just giving them a significant break. Raphael Rondon was previously sentenced to 14 months of incarceration after he pled guilty in federal court in New York to possession of an unregistered firearm after the FBI found an unregistered sawed-off shotgun when it searched the Rondon's home. Raphael Rondon admitted to the FBI that on January 6, 2021, he helped a man who was trying to rip cords out of Pelosi's laptop, which he used for Zoom meetings. I assisted him a little bit, <laughs> Raphael Rondon said, and that was probably stupid of me. He later told the FBI that he wished he'd taken a photo of a rioter on the Senate dais because, quote, that shit was fucking hilarious. <laughs> For his sentencing, Raphael Rondon said that he would never engage in that type of behavior and that he was acting very immaturely. I made a stupid mistake, he said. I realize that. Mooney Rondon, who owns a medical billing company, admitted that she helped a man who took the laptop, giving him gloves so he would not leave fingerprints behind. The scene was captured in one of the many videos fellow rioters recorded on their smartphones. The man who took the laptop has still not yet been identified or, or, or at least arrested. Uh, interesting. Mooney Rondon said she had a very bad, very bad, had lapse of judgment on January 6th. I'm a very generally measured, calculated person. I think things through. How the heck that happened? I really don't have a clue, she said. Ahead of her sentencing, oh, Wednesday, Mooney Rondon called herself a humbled woman and asked the court for mercy. I was the adult in the room and I failed, she said. I have 
brought embarrassment to my family. If we had to do it all over, we would have just stayed home and watched from the safety of our living room, she continued. But when she finished her prepared statement and the judge asked her to explain what she was thinking when she decided to aid in the theft of Pelosi's laptop, Mooney Rondon pivoted saying she thought January 6th photos and videos that had been cherry-picked and suggesting that the man who stole Pelosi's laptop was part of a broader scheme and that he was working with others who were similarly dressed. She said she was scared and went along with the laptop theft because it was the easiest thing to do. Well, that's got, so cool. Yeah. <laughs> You're supposed to steal stuff just because it's the easiest thing to do. Oh, why not? We were there, you know, uh, in prison for Raphael Rondon and 46 months in prison for Marianne Rooney, Mooney Rondon. Online sleuths identified the pair after the FBI raided and a home of an Alaska man, a woman, mm -hmm. and mistakenly thought was Mooney Rondon. That woman, Marilyn Huper, was on the grounds of the Capitol on January 6th with her husband, but does not appear to have entered the building. Neither of the Hupers has been charged. A sleuth who helped identify the Rondons using facial recognition in an interview for the book Sedition Hunters how January 6th broke the justice system, called the, um, uh, I'm just going to read this from here because it's a little bit uh, weird, called the FBI's raid of the Alaska home an embarrassing fuck up and said they initially didn't believe that the FBI could mess up that badly. The sleuths were able to identify the duo in about a half hour, confirming the facial recognition a uh, bit uh, uh, with a, with the help of the Mooney Rondon Facebook page, which featured images of her wearing the same items of jewelry she wore to the Capitol on January sixth. So now I I uh, found, I know I don't know them personally, but I have a friend. His name is Joel, and yeah. Joel knows the Hoopers. So I tried to get them some media attention, and they did end up uh, going on a, a couple of different shows, but. They went to their house. It was actually their bed and breakfast, okay? And apparently they're pastors from uh, from San Diego, right? So my friend uh, said, yes, I've known them for like, you know, since I was a, a kid, they've been my pastors. And uh, so they, they come in at like 6 in the morning. I think that was the same day they raided Giuliani at 6 a.m. Oh. in the morning. So it was a, it was like a coordinated strike. So apparently they came to the bed breakfast and they were not up. They were still sleeping. And by the second time they came, they knocked the door down and then they handcuffed them. They took her pocket constitution, which why would you do that? Because. And then they kept saying, this is you, this is you. And she's like, that's not, she, she, she said they didn't show her the picture or even uh, the subpoena. Right. Right. Uh, not subpoena, but whatever it is that they they use to come and do these these dirty deeds, and so they wouldn't show her any paperwork, and they had her handcuffed and her husband handcuffed, and they interrogated her for like three hours before they finally said, "This is you." She said, "Show me the picture," and they showed it. And she's like, "That's not me." She says, "You know, I I wasn't even wearing that at the Capitol," and she said, "This is weird because you guys have facial recognition." So how is it you don't know that that's me? So I had contacted them and tried to get them on a couple of shows. And I told my friend that this um, this article had just come out. But I just thought that was of interesting wow. note regarding the hoopers <laughs> or the halpers. Or, uh, so this is a story about the safety deposit holder. Her name is, this is Linda Martin. She's one of many. And I shortened the story because it was very long. Sure. Um, so... FBI agents cataloged Cartier bracelets, Rolex watches, watches, and stacks of cash as they combed through safe deposit boxes seized from a Beverly Hills business accused of money laundering. But the owners of many of those boxes were not accused of any crimes. After hearing arguments from both sides Thursday, a panel of judges from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals will decide whether the sweeping raid violated customers' Fourth Amendment rights. I think the public seizes and recognizes this is a total abuse of people's constitutional rights. Institute for Justice senior attorney Rob Johnson told Fox News, adding that he felt extremely optimistic 
about the panel's forthcoming decision. Now, this is uh, this is like a picture of some of the things. It says FBI okay. agencies are on 1,400 safe deposit boxes from U.S. private vaults in Beverly Hills, California. Can you imagine what was in there? And they say there's no abuse of power there, right? Right. I mean, you could have had, like, I don't know, blackmail materials on the FBI, right? Who's going to report that? Nobody. So we don't know what was in those 1,400 safe deposit boxes. On March 22nd, 2021, the FBI seized around 1,400 safe deposit boxes from U.S. private vaults, a Beverly Hills-based company that, according to court documents, was regularly used by unsavory characters to store criminal proceeds. And I'm also going to say this. So if you if these people are not going to come forward, because some of them are, right? Some right. of them are legit. But the unsavory ones... Uh, who's to prevent the, the people that empty those boxes to pocket whatever was in there because no one's ever going to come and ask them for that back? Oh. Agents took about $86 million in cash from the boxes as well as a trove of jewelry, gold bars and coins, silver and other valuables. In May of that year, the FBI commenced administrative forfeiture proceedings against an unspecified number of the boxes according to court documents, meaning that there were illegal activities uh, involved because it's for forfeiture asset from criminal uh, endeavors. Civil asset forfeiture is a process through which the government seizes money or other property believed to be linked to a crime without ever charging the owner. That's convenient, isn't it? A little bit all the time, apparently these days. Yes, U.S. private vaults eventually pled guilty to money laundering, but as right because that was probably the 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 currency that they dealt in. Um, as of October 2022, the U.S. Attorney's Office said it, it had not filed any other criminal charges. A spokesperson on Thursday declined to comment on the case and would not immediately could not immediately answer whether additional criminal card charges were ever filed. Several of the safe deposit box renters who haven't been charged filed a class action lawsuit accusing the government of violating their Fourth Amendment protection from unreasonable siege, search and seizure in the, and their Fifth Amendment protection from having private property taken without compensation. On Thursday, attorneys from the Institute of Justice argued that the FBI broke up in hundreds of safe deposit boxes, and then it tried to civilly forfeit everything in those boxes worth over $5,000 after the raid without any probable cause. The search had an objective function to undercover, un uncover evidence of crimes, Johnson argued. IJ wants the appeals court to definitively state that the FBI violated individuals' rights and to force the federal government to destroy copies it made of customers' private documents. And here's the other thing. So, so let's say you were a customer that had some private documents in there that you were going to use for blackmail, and now the FBI is going to use it, right? The, the people that are in charge, now they have these, including medical records. Wills and trusts, if they have wills and trusts, they can destroy those if they were original copies. And now you're, uh, you know, S-O-L, while agents search the boxes. The appeal comes after a lower court last year sided with the FBI. Unsealed court documents showed the FBI and U.S. Attorney's Office never told the judge in their warrant request that they planned to confiscate the contents of every box containing at least 5000 in cash or belongings. The warrant only authorized agents to seize business computers, money counters, and surveillance equipment. The judge also allowed them to seize safety deposit boxes and keys, but specifically wrote that agents should only inspect the contents of the boxes in an effort to identify their owners so they can claim their property. And that warrant does not authorize criminal search or seizure of the contents of the safety deposit boxes. But while attorneys for the plaintiffs showed the government they had a dual motive in inventorying the contents of each deposit box, agents did not, did not exceed the bounds of the warrant. Federal judge Gary Klausner ruled whose side of the fence is Gary Klausner on and a reasonable judge would have inferred that the inventory could lead to the potential discovery of criminal proceeds in certain boxes, which would then lead to forfeiture. Klauser wrote during Thursday's court appearance, Victor Rogers argued on behalf of the government that the FBI went above and beyond to reunite its customers with their property by posting a notice on the window of USPB. Seriously? <laughs> oh my God. All they had to do was contact the FBI. Who wants to contact the FBI? 
Roger said. Judges grilled the government's attorney on whether the FBI ignored the warrants limitations, why agents even need needed to open the seed boxes, and why drug sniffing dogs were present during the seizure. <laughs> why? Okay, I can tell you why. Anybody can tell you why. A move IJ alleged was taken solely for the purposes of uncovering evidence of crimes. Yeah, I'd have the drug sniffing dogs there too. How do you yeah. know you're going to put your hand in a, a, a safety deposit box full of fentanyl? It was really nice to hear the judges ask questions that seemed to put the counsel for the FBI on the back foot, said Jenny Pearsons, a nonprofit director who rented a box at USPV, that they were being truly questioned about the morality of what happened. It was a good feeling to be there in court today. I don't think that's what, I don't think she's going to get what she thought. Okay, I'm just saying, I don't think so. The panel is expected to issue a decision in a few months. And finally, the FBI declined to comment on pending litigation. They do that all the time. No, I'm sorry. We cannot uh, comment on pending litigation. And then that pending litigation has no, you know, end date. The, the agency calls for forfeiture an important tool. Agency calls forfeiture an important tool for disrupting and dismantling criminal and terrorist organizations and punishing criminals, as well as compensating victims and protecting communities. Well, they're not compensating the actual people that are now victims because they were perpetrators against them. Forfeiture generated more than $45.7 in revenue. For the federal government alone between 2000 and 2019, according to IJ, IJ has filed several lawsuits related to the USPV raid. Since then, FBI has returned some of the customer's belongings. Pearson no. said she and her husband got most of their property back, but about 2000 is still unaccounted for more than two years in the raids. That's because they bought hamburgers and no, fries. Yeah for all the FBI. It's just been a long journey. It's been a, just a long journey to get accountability to this from the government, said Travis May, who also used a box at U.S. private vaults to store gold and cash. Obviously, the journey is not over. But today, felt very good to have seen those mm -hmm. concerns are being taken seriously. I'm just going to laugh. <laughs> Speaking <laughs> of laughs, here's another idiot whose political career has come to an end because he was a rhino. Representative Kevin McCarthy, Republican California, announced Wednesday he's going to resign his congressional seat after being ousted as House Speaker. So McCarthy sad. made the announcement in an opinion piece for the Wall Street Urinal. <laughs> no matter the odds or personal cost, we did the right thing, he said. That may seem out of fashion in Washington these days, but... Delivering results for the American people is still celebrated across the country. It is in this spirit that I have decided to depart the House at the end of this year to what serve America I in new ways. Yeah, I, I wonder how. I, I, I just, I'm dying. I, know. Know. I know my work is only getting started, McCarthy wrote. I will continue to recruit our country's best and brightest to run for elected office. So he's looking for people unlike himself, in other words. The right. Republican Party is expanding every day, and I am committed to lending my experience to support the next generation of Great. leaders. McCarthy surmised it often seems that the uh, move Washington does... Uh, that the more Washington does, the worse America gets. Well, that's true. That's true. Like I started my career as a small business owner, and I look forward to helping entrepreneurs and risk takers reach their full potential. Mm. The challenges we face are more likely to be solved by innovation than legislation. He detailed that the most reliable solution to what ails America is before our eyes. Right? Um, yes. People like you out of are, Congress. Exactly. Everyday men and women who are raising families showing up for work, volunteering, and pursuing the American dream with passion and purpose. Unlike running for office where you make a career out of using other people's money for your own gains, I agree with President Reagan's uh, observation that all great changes in America start at the dinner table. I have no idea what that even means. It uh, means uh, clean up your dishes, I guess. Despite the best attempts by special interest groups and the news media to divide us, I have seen the goodness of the American people. They are what will ultimately uphold the enduring values of our great nation. We have all a role to play in that effort, McCarthy wrote. I never could have imagined the journey when I first threw my hat into the ring. I go knowing, I go knowing I left it all <laughs> on the field. As always, with a smile on my face and looking back, 
I wouldn't have had it any other day, other way. <laughs> in America. He also wasn't going to have any other days there. No, so he's running out of time. <laughs> McCarthy started the op-ed by writing, I'm an optimist. Right. How could I not be? He went on to detail how he's the son of a oh, firefighter, excuse me, and served in the same congressional seat for the last 17 years. That's a career Dang. problem. Ironically, from the same office in which he previously denied an in was previously right. denied an internship. They knew in the beginning. <laughs> you know why he probably was denied an internship? You know what you know they do with those young interns, don't you? These Congress. Oh people? Lord, I don't even know. McCarthy want recalled <laughs> how he helped Republicans to a House majority twice. We got more Republican women, veterans, and minorities elected to Congress at one time than any. Uh, than ever before, he wrote, I remain cheerfully persistent. Uh, I remained cheerfully persistent when elected speaker because I knew what we could accomplish. Well, apparently they didn't agree with you because you right? were <laughs> You were like, cheerful and they were like, ah. Was he there more than about two weeks? Uh, listing his accomplishments, listing his accomplishments, he continued, even with slim margins in the house we passed legislation to secure the border right oh, that, we got to get jj we got to get jj carroll's opinion on this on monday oh. on our achieve energy independence of right. uh, that for that electric vehicles reduce of crime this reduce is, this is crime, a comedy snl act hold government accountable and establish a parents bill of rights we did exactly uh what we said we would do. McCarthy was the first House Speaker to be voted out of the position in U.S. history. <laughs> With the departure of former Representative George Santos and McCarthy, the House GOP margin Santa goes down to just two to the end of the year. At the start of 2024, the House will have 220 sitting Republicans and 213 Democrats with two vacancies. Uh, a 218 majority is needed to pass legislation, meaning the GOP can only afford to lose two votes to pass a bill. If the GOP loses three votes, that legislative proposal will fail. New York Governor Kathy Hochul, a Democrat, has already set a special election for Santos's third district on February the 13th. Yeah, it's about time. So here's the here's the little Hollywood. I, I like start putting some of the Hollywood stories here. Good. Um, I can do like some political and then the Hollywood stories here. So this is uh, Hollywood stories. Uh, Chevy Chase. We need we a theme for that. We need a theme for the hot Hollywood stuff. Just we do. I, I will make one. So yeah, do that. Chevy Chase. Um, we just reported on him the other day because he lit this house. Uh, all the, the uh, twinkly lights. $25,000 twinkly lights on this guy's house. Yes. So he started the house when his dad died. And now uh, it's actually housing homeless people. It's just burgeoning. So uh, I, I found this. Chevy Chase, he fell, 80. he fell off the stage. Okay. Uh, and I also, I didn't put it in here, but I found, I was, when I was looking for this article, I found one when he was on SNL 10 years ago where he's like in a wheelchair. They bring him in in a wheelchair. I should have I should have played it, but oh. you know it is YouTube. And and he he gets out of the the wheelchair to get whatever it is because he's not really wheelchair bound. So I don't know if this was like a prank thing, but he did for nice. sure fall off. Yeah. And then he also he has one of those Apple watches or something like yeah. that. And it said uh, <laughs> they're like, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? And he says. Um, my watch is talking to me. It says you've taken a big fall. It does do that. I'm going to tell you something funny. I have an Apple watch, right? I mean, I, you know, and what happens is if you are, if you shake your wrist the wrong way, or like when I'm walking our dogs, if, if they tug on the leash a certain way, it gets the impression that something has happened to you and it has, and that you've fallen. And it says, looks like you've taken a, tumble and if you don't immediately punch a thing on your watch that says no i'm okay because it gives you not you know and then does it call 911 it calls 911 for you oh my god <laughs> so you have to say first you have to say no i didn't fall or first i'm okay and then it says did you fall or not and then you have to say no i didn't fall or you know, I did, but oh, I don't wow. mean. Wow! Does it recognize your voice? Because if somebody kills you, can they get on your Apple yeah. Watch and say, "No, I'm all right"? 
I, I think it does. It does. Okay. So Chevy Chase 80 falls off stage at National Lampoon's Christmas vacation event after arriving on stage in a wheelchair one day after insisting he's in amazing shape. The actor 80 arrived on stage <laughs> in a wheelchair before walking towards the crowd. However, he stepped off the stage and he fell to the ground to grasp from the crowd. I mean, he literally, David, he literally like it was a catwalk and he literally like walks out and <laughs> you don't see him on camera anymore he was helped back up afterwards and seemed in good spirits tipping his trademark baseball cap to relieve fans this comes after chase's manager insisted the star is in amazing health despite the actor sparking concern why he was pictured in a wheelchair this week chevy chase shocked fans when he fell off stage in a national lampoon's christmas vacation q a <laughs> I'm sorry, in Buffalo on Wednesday. So everyone's like, it's Chevy Chase. Come on, man. This is just a pratfall, right? The actor, 80, who recently insisted he was in amazing health, looked cheery as he attended the screening with the star arriving on stage in a wheelchair before walking towards the crowd at Chase Performing Arts Center. However, the, the actor stepped off the stage and fell to the ground due to gr gasp from the crowd. He was helped up afterwards and seemed in good spirits, tipping his trademark hat. He was helped. Uh, a spokesman for Chase told DailyMail.com he took a fall at the part of the stage that was not well lit, but thanks to his fans on SNL, it was like riding a bike again. Just a little boo-boo. All good. This comes after Chase manager insisted that he was in excellent health. Um, he says he was pictured in a wheelchair while supporting his close friend Sylvester Stallone at the weekend. Oh, um, my God. <laughs> And this story, this story, I, I saw this yesterday as well. Now, I am a fan of Tim Allen because he is a, he's a conservative. I mean, he, he really is a conservative and a Trump supporter. However, uh, this we story know, only know these people. <laughs> this story only confirms something else I've already heard about Tim Allen. Now, as you, some people may know Tim Allen lives in California, but he also has a house about 15 minutes away from me in Michigan. Oh, really? Um, oh, yeah. He lives right right near us. And he, um, you know, he and he does some nice things for people. He really does. But sometimes he can be a prick. And apparently <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of the women that he worked with in the television series, The Santa Clauses, which was based on a series of movies he made in which he played Santa Claus, is saying he's not the nicest guy in the world to work with. Happy right. Endings alum Casey Wilson, not holding back when it comes to her real thoughts about Tim Allen. Wilson, 43, opened up during a recent episode of the Bitch Sesh, it's a, a podcast, that worked with the 70-year-old home improvement star on the Santa Clauses. She said it was no easy task for her. She said, Tim Allen was such a bitch. It was truly the single worst experience I've ever had with a co-star ever, Wilson said in the episode of her show, uh, which she hosts alongside fellow actress and comedian Danielle Schneider. While talking about her experience on the TV show, Wilson said she had buried the story because of a friendship with one of the show's producers. But she added that her kids also loved the movie. So she really didn't want to, she really didn't want to slam the guy, but she hey. says, when I'm in the scene, it's just me and Tim Allen. And I'm supposed to throw things at him. Wilson said, recalling her time on the set, the host of the great American baking show appeared in the first episode of the television series, the Santa Clauses as the grown up version of a character from the original movie, The Santa Claus. If you ever saw the original movie, which I have, I, I have, I've seen those, them both. There was I love those movies. Santa Claus. And there's a scene where he, in the first movie, he comes down the chimney, and there's this little girl, and she's sleeping on the couch, and he kind of wakes her up, and she recognizes him, and he tells her to go back to sleep, and then she says, "I left some milk and cookies on the um, table," and and he, he's kind of grumpy because he really doesn't want to be Santa Claus at that point. In, in in the in the rich original movie, and so she he doesn't take any of the milk. She says, "Why didn't you take uh, some milk?" He says, "Because I'm say lactose, lactose intolerant. intolerant." Okay, well, apparently <laughs> this woman here is not the same actress that was the little girl in that movie, but she played the adult version of that girl. Now all okay. grown up, he's coming into her house to deliver presents again. I think he's a burglar, she says. So he's coming down the chimney, obviously a Santa, and I'm woken up thinking there's an intruder basically like a home invasion scene. So I'm throwing things at him and he goes over to the producer who is standing four feet from me and goes, and I hear him say this, 
you got to tell her to stop stepping on my lines. The producer turns to me <laughs> and on his face, walks up one foot to me and says, Tim asked that you stop stepping on his lines, Wilson <laughs> claimed. Um, the actress added that in her experience, the Toy Story star made people on set uncomfortable, telling Snyder that everybody was walking on eggshells and that people just looked frantic. She went on to say when he was done, he was so effing rude, never made eye can contact, never said anything. I was so uncomfortable. Wilson also alleged that Alan was, when he was done for the day, he left abruptly, and she was informed that this may not be unusual behavior for Alan. It's the end, and Tim Allen goes, leaving. <laughs> um, and she says, then they hustle in this stand, stand-in guy to do the rest of the scene with her, you know, and he's pretty much night. Well, but basically, the, the bottom line for this is that I've heard these stories before. When uh, I have a friend who I used to work with before I retired years ago who volunteers at the um, second largest Thanksgiving Day Parade in America, which is the Detroit Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, um, just like the one in New York. And he always, this friend of mine is always in the parade. He's kind of like part of the group. And one year, Tim Allen was the grand marshal of the parade. And they, everybody was told, don't talk to him. Don't look oh, at wow. him. Don't put <laughs> in the float, you know, you're not allowed. <laughs> Apparently, he really, he really thinks he is, you know. Dang. Uh, what uh, happens to people, David? Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, you know, I I feel bad, but you know, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, that that's just. I mean, there are so many other very humble comedians, um, like Roseanne Barr. <laughs> I love her. I know, um, I know many, you know, I know many who are really super people, uh, in not just from this show, but I mean. We've we've met some. We we we've talked to some really nice people on the show, and I, I know yeah. some. Rick local Overton, know. very nice guy. I grew Love up in the guy. same. I grew up in the same city. Not that I live in now, but the same city, which is about twenty minutes from here, that I grew up in. That Dave Coulier now lived in, and now came back, and he's living there again. I mean, he's he's still in show business, but he decided to come back to Michigan and live in the same neighborhood that he lived there before. His father still lives. Nicest guy in the world. No ego. Nothing, but then some other people are, you know, kind of crazy. All right, I'm going to leave you with this last story here today, and I think you'll uh, you'll appreciate this one. <clears throat> are you ready for this one? All right, here yeah. it is. <sighs> here it is. This is funny. You, do, <laughs> a Florida couple, a Jacksonville, Florida couple, tied the knot while riding through a car wash. Bruce and Ingrid Melvin said they looked into several different types of weddings, but they all would cost a lot of time and money. They settled on a ceremony at the car wash because they love unique, one-of-a-kind experiences. And, again, they're stingier than your health insurance. Right, her husband was cheap. Plan. Ingrid <laughs> also gets her car washed almost every day. Bruce and Ingrid sat in the front while their officiant sat in the back seat. In case you want to contribute to their wedding, they're uh, registered with armor all. <laughs> so that's the truth. Well, anything else about the Ingrid says she likes the bumper blaster. What? Oh, and oh, oh God. I don't even want to know. Oh. <laughs> Before the honeymoon, Mr. Melvin said he wanted to stop at the quick lube. Again for the car. Okay. The quick. Think sure. about that one for all. not too long. Okay. That's going to do it for this edition of the Awake Nation News. We post it Monday through Friday before 6 p.m. Eastern time. Also, please join us Monday through Friday for the Awake Nation on our Rumble channel, uh, the David Zublick channel, and also on our television show website, awakenation.tv. Have yourselves a great weekend. We'll be back Monday at by 6 p.m. Eastern with another edition of the Awake Nation News. In the meantime, we're out of news, so we are out of here. Zublik out. Shepherd out. <laughs>